custom when a new king came to the throne. Any claimant to the throne of a former dynasty would be executed. So when King David found out that a grandson of Saul was still living, what was he to do? Welcome to Through the Bible. Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, answers this intriguing question as we come to what he calls one of the most beautiful stories in the scriptures. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus as we continue our study in the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. Now, since we've got a few minutes before our study, I'll grab our mailbag and maybe share a letter that we've recently received from one of you, a member of our Bible Bus listening family. This is from Susan in Colonial Beach, Virginia. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I just want to say that I thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for through the Bible and for all you are doing to put the Word of God before all people. The past several years have been really rough for me because of my own sin and just normal life. Through it all, the Lord Jesus has never let me go and has been so good and faithful. Recently, you read a letter from a listener who suffers with depression. I can relate. Depression has been in my life since I was eight years old. Thank the Lord Jesus for finding me in my wanderings and saving me. My older brother told me about TTB in 1988. Every day, the word encourages me and helps keep me going. Thank you for being faithful to our Lord Jesus and his word. The recent sermon where Dr. McGee spoke about the lamb he raised and then slaughtered really showed me Jesus. The Lord Jesus never said a word when the Father had him hung on the tree for us. He totally trusted the Father and obeyed him for our sakes. Thank you again for your faithfulness in teaching me God's ways. Well, thanks for your letter, Susan. You know, it's such a privilege that you chose to share your joys and struggles as you followed the Lord. And I'm sure that many people hearing this can relate today. So thank you for that. May you be blessed as you continue to study his word. What about you? What's your story? How's God using our time in his word in your life? Is he changing you, challenging you? Does a particular message in the Bible maybe have new significance for you? Well, we'd love to hear about it, so please get in contact with us today. You can call our listener testimony line at 1-800-65-BIBLE, email us at biblebus at ttb.org, or send your note to box 7100. Pasadena, California, 91109. Canadian listeners, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that just as you worked in David's life so long ago, you're still working in our lives today. Help us to recognize your presence in our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we continue on In the story of David, as we follow his exploits, he's now been made king. He's brought the ark of God up to Jerusalem. And when he got it up there, he wanted to build God a house. God told him that he would not be able to do it himself, but that God would build David a house. And then the Lord made his covenant with David, a great covenant, and actually whole prophecies that follow most of the book of Psalms rest upon that covenant God made with David. The kingdom is the kingdom that you find here in that seventh chapter of Second Samuel. And so we come now to the eighth chapter, and we see David now being fully established in the kingdom. And I want to begin reading here at verse 1. After this, that is, after God made his covenant with David, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And we find that he had a great victory over them. They were the perpetual and inveterate enemies of Israel. And David drove them back, not only out of the land of Israel, but drove them even beyond 
their own borders and enlarge his own borders because they were in a great section of that land, especially the second session, that is, southern part. Now, in verse 4, I read, And David took from him. This is the king of Zobab. He had a border that went as far as the river Euphrates. And we're told that David took from him a thousand chariots, 700 horsemen, 20,000 footmen. And David hewed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. Quite interesting the way David got rid of these horses. We were told back in Deuteronomy... God made a rule for the kings. One of the rules was just simply this. He's not to multiply horses. And also interesting note, he was not to multiply horses or wives. David multiplied wives. And we find that Solomon multiplied both horses and wives. But David apparently here is attempting to follow the Lord in this particular matter. Now, I'm not going into any more detail in this chapter. For those of you who like to explore new areas, new land, you'd enjoy taking this chapter and seeing the different areas in which David moved. He enlarged the borders of Israel. Now, he extended them in the south. He extended them to the east in the land of the Moabites. And we find here... He extended them in the north, the Syrians of Damascus. David was able to take them. And so we find that Syria and Moab, Ammon and the Philistines and the Amalekites, all of these became subject to David. And we are told in verse 13, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the valley of Salt being 18,000 men. And we are told he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So that now is in the south to the east, in the southwest, southeast, and to the east, and now to the north, why David was able to push back his borders enlarged the kingdom. Wasn't any use to say he pushed them to the west because that's where the ocean was and they had already were that far. The border in the west was the Mediterranean Sea. Now we're told in verse 15, And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. David was noted for that. We find that there's a tremendous now expansion an extension of the kingdom. And David now actually brought the kingdom to its zenith and made it really a world power in that day that would correspond to the other kingdoms of that day. Now that brings us to the ninth chapter of Second Samuel, and we come here to one of the loveliest stories that you have in the Scripture. And this is a story that, very frankly... It reveals what a great man David really was. We always think of David in connection with that sin he committed. And probably that's a natural thing to do. For instance, suppose I had before me right now a great white sheep right before me. All of you that are listening can imagine that. Now, let me say that there is one little black spot on that screen. Some ink got on that. Now, as you look at the white screen, what is the most impressive thing about it? There is this vast area of white, but when you put a picture on the screen, that is, you put one little black spot, that stands out. Suppose that you ride down the highway, as I have done in West Texas, And you see probably a couple thousand sheep over in the field, and there's one that's black. Which sheep do you really see? Well, in the life of David, we always concentrate on the one big sin. And it was a big one. We'll deal with it when we get to it. 
but we give sparse attention to his noble life, to the exploits of this man. Someone has put it like this, there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it behooves most of us not to talk about the rest of us. Maybe we ought to be a little bit more careful about our viewpoint of David. Now, there's so many wonderful bright spots in the long life of David. From that young shepherd boy who slew a giant to an old man wise in experience and who could write, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, here we're looking at one of those events. In chapter 9, we have the story of Mephibosheth. You remember I mentioned him once before. Now we've come to him. He was a grandson of Saul, but he was a son of Jonathan. And we're told here that David now befriends him. Now, you must recall the background that Saul had been the pitiless foe and the bitter enemy of David. And at the death of Saul, David began to marshal his forces. And according to the oriental custom of that day, it was the law of that day, a new king would naturally put to death all contenders to the throne of a former dynasty. Any claimant would be removed by execution. That would protect him, you see. Now, according to the code of that day, David would have been justified in putting to death any of the offspring of Saul. And believe me, David was not a mess or squeamish in doing such things, even among his followers. How about the story of Uriah the Hittite? Well, Jonathan, the son of Saul, died with his father in the same battle. But Jonathan had a son. He'd been hidden away, lest David take him and kill him. And the name of this boy was Mephibosheth. And David could more firmly establish his throne by slaying Mephibosheth, removing the last vestige of danger. But Ziba, a servant of Saul, betrayed the hiding place of Mephibosheth. And David could have taken him and killed him. Now listen to the story. I begin reading at chapter 9, verse 1. And David said... Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thy Ziba? He said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent, fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Now you see, when Mephibosheth came before David, he fully expected to be executed. He was a dead dog, if you please. And David, when he was brought before him, Mephibosheth falls down on his face before David. And David speaks so kindly to him, just calls him by name. He says, Mephibosheth. And this boy says, Behold thy servant, David said unto him, Fear not, for I'll surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And I'll restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now, isn't that a lovely thing that he does? David puts him at ease, you see. And David shows him kindness. He restores his inheritance to him, and he gave him a place at the king's table. Now, notice the reaction of Mephibosheth to all of this. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? And believe me, had there been another king on the throne, and had that king been his own father, and he had been the son of David, 
been a different story. He'd have been slain. You may be sure of that. This is something that is amazing. Why, Mephibosheth counts himself as a dead dog. But David doesn't call him that. David says, you're no dead dog. You're Mephibosheth. You're the son of Jonathan. And he says to him, I intend to show kindness to you. And now will you notice the reaction again of this man? He bowed himself. What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servant shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table." Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. That's quite a household to feed, you see. So this property and land of Saul's that was his inheritance was turned over to him, but it belongs to Mephibosheth. David sees that it belongs to him. Now, here is something that is quite interesting that I want you to note because I want to read now verses 9 and 10. Thou therefore and thy sons, and I'm reading verse 10, and thy servants shall till the land for him, shall bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Verse 11, Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and he was lame on both his feet. Now, I want you to notice this. This is such a lovely gesture on the part of David, and it's one of those acts of nobility which David performed. You remember in the case of Abigail, he did the same thing when her husband, actually, if his name means a fool, or you can call him stupid, acted as he did. Why, it was at that time that David did a very noble thing in sparing this man who had done this thing to him. The fact of the matter is, he'd insulted him. Now, will you notice that not only is this a wonderful act, but there's some impressive lessons here for us. They're great spiritual truths, and I wouldn't want you to miss them today. First of all, a child of God should recognize that he too is a cripple. You see, we're told there Feet are swift to shed blood. That's the report from God's clinic of the human race. They've all gone out of the way. Our feet lead us astray. Each one, we're told, is turned to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then again, Proverbs says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof of the way is of death. You know, our feet get us in trouble. And it's quite interesting in the way that the soul and the feet are closely connected in Scripture. And I do not mean to make a bad pun, but I'm not talking about the soul of your feet. The soul, S-O-U-L, and the feet are closely put together in Scripture. I'd like for you to notice that over in Psalm 56, verse 13. Listen to this. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling? that I may walk before God in the light of thy living. And that's David who wrote that. And remember, he had a boy all of his life at his table who was lame in both of his feet. And then in Psalm 73, verse 2, he says here, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. David knew what it was to have lame feet also. And then in Psalm 116, Verse 8, we read there, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, 
mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling, so that you and I are actually cripples before God. But you know, today, modern philosophy and humanism presents another picture of man. I heard a liberal say Christ came to reveal the splendors of the human soul. Well, God says out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, and it's a mess of bad things. You can't expect any good from human nature. Paul could say, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And he says he had no confidence in the flesh. This is the way, God says, walk ye in it. But the law is condemnation. But the Lord Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And when we come that way, he'll receive us. Now, there's something else that's amazing in this incident. David extended kindness to Mephibosheth for the sake of Jonathan. Not because of Mephibosheth. He didn't know him. It was for the sake of Jonathan that he loved. When he looked upon this boy, he didn't see a cripple. He saw Jonathan. He made a covenant with Jonathan. And the kindness and mercy and the grace that he extended was because of another. Now, you want to know what David thought of Jonathan? Well, he thought that he was a very wonderful person. Now, the Lord Jesus has saved you and me because of another, and that other is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told we're accepted in the Beloved. When he sees you and me in Christ, why, he accepts us and he saves us. Now, the interesting thing is this. David said nothing about the lame feet of Mephibosheth. There's no record that David ever mentioned it, made no allusion to it. He never said to him, it's too bad that you're a cripple. He treated him as a prince, and he sat at the table, and his feet were covered with a linen cloth. You know, God forgets sins because they've been blotted out by the death of Christ. They've been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way God can forgive you and me our sins, my friend. This is the way he put it in Hebrews 10:17, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And then here's something else I'd have you note here. Mephibosheth said nothing about his lame feet. You see, what do you think David and Mephibosheth talked about when they sat at the table? They talked about another. And you know who that was? It is about Jonathan. David loved Jonathan. Mephibosheth loved Jonathan. He was his father. They talked about him. What do you and I talk about? You know, some Christians take a keen delight in telling about the old days when they lived in sin. They also take keen delight in running some other Christian down. It's too bad when we get together we don't talk like David and Mephibosheth did about not Jonathan, but about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, you know, others that were at the table, they didn't talk about his lame feet. There's a large company that ate at the table of a king, and one day they saw David bringing this little cripple, and the gossips did not say, did you hear how it happened? They listened to the king. They heard him praise him. They had no time to indulge in cheap talk. Their hearts went out in love to this boy, Mephibosheth. You see, love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, and love never fails. These things, you see, have been written for our admonition. David was never able to make this boy walk as far as I can tell. If you see that, you cannot walk well-pleasing to God. Turn to him. Turn to the Lord Jesus. He said to the palsied man, let down through the roof. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee, rise and walk. And God says that to you and me today. He says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you walk well-pleasing, that you walk worthy of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Christ has sent out invitations today in the highways and byways, out in the streets of your town, and he's saying, come to my table of salvation, just as you are a cripple, and I'll feed you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. And if any man hunger, if any man thirst, let him come unto him and drink. What a wonderful picture this is that we have 
here in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. We'll begin in chapter 10 next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. There are so many great lessons here in 2 Samuel. If you'd like to continue your own study of this wonderful book, then hop aboard the Bible bus this weekend for the Sunday Sermon. Dr. McGee's message is based in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and it's titled The Most Outstanding Prophetic Passage. To listen online or see if your station carries this broadcast, visit us at ttb.org. And if we can help you find maybe a particular Bible study resource or something else, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And, of course, join us next week as our great adventure in God's Word continues here on Through the Bible. Jesus came home, be my home. Sin had left a prison We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole Word to the whole world.